Well, as people are checking in on the chat, I want to welcome you all to Anabaptist Witness Dialogues. This is a new webinar um, of Anabaptist Witness Journal. I'm Jamie Pitts. I edit Anabaptist Witness Journal, and I'll be your host. Um, I'm enjoying seeing where people are checking in from, and uh, as Andrew Hudson mentioned, we are here in the St. Joseph uh, River watershed on uh, Potawatomi and Miami ancestral land, uh, currently part of the Pokagon Band, uh, Potawatomi territory. Um, and it's wonderful to see folks from uh, not only all over North America, but uh, the world. So welcome to you all. I am very pleased uh, in this first Anabaptist Witness Dialogue uh, session to be joined by Elaine Inns and Ched Myers. Elaine is a restorative justice educator and Ched is an activist theologian. They are partners, Mennonites, and co-directors of Bartimaeus Cooperative Ministries on unceded Chumash territory in the Ventura River watershed of Southern California. In 2009, they co-authored the two-volume work, Ambassadors of Reconciliation, and today we'll, we'll be discussing their forthcoming book, Healing Haunted Histories, A Settler Discipleship of Decolonization. Welcome, Elaine and Ched. Thank you, Jamie. It's great to be here. Um, we are uh, beaming in from Chumash territory. And I just want to say a quick uh, thank you. There's just so many folks on the chat. Uh, so grateful to see you all. And I do want to do a special uh, shout out to Marlene Epp. I'm assuming that is the Marlene from Conrad Rabel uh, University. She was a professor of mine. and. Uh, greatly influence this work. So Marlene, thanks so much for being a part of this. Elaine, Chad, why don't you start off by just giving a description of the book? What's this book about? Well, hey, everybody. Um, good morning from the West Coast. Um, you know, tomorrow we celebrate the birthday of Martin Luther King Jr. here in the US. It's a national holiday. Almost 60 years ago, this greatest American prophet wrote, quote, for too long the depth of racism in American life has been underestimated. The surgery necessary to extract it is necessarily complex and detailed. We have to x-ray our history to reveal the full extent of the disease. And then King goes on to say, our nation was born in genocide when it embraced the doctrine that the original American, the Indian, was an inferior race. Even before there were large numbers of Negroes on our shore, the scar of racial hatred had already disfigured colonial society. And he concludes by saying, it is this tangled web of prejudice from which many Americans now seek to liberate themselves without realizing how deeply it has been woven into their consciousness, end quote. Well, obviously, you know, these words take on an even more poignant meaning after last week's white supremacist assault on this nation's capital. But it is also a dramatic and concise statement of the problem that we're trying to tackle in this book. We seek to engage what he called the full extent of the disease of settler colonialism in North America. We decided to describe it in biblical terms as <clears throat> unclean spirits that continue to both occupy the land and resources and possess our communities and psyches. We all inhabit this history of dispossession, disparity and racist violence that has been unfolding over five millennia, leaving no corner of Turtle Island untouched. And we are all haunted by these spirits. So uh, we who are descendants of European settlers, we typically try to cope with our dis-ease through denial and self-exoneration. 
even as we continue to benefit from a continuing colonial system. But of course, this only exacerbates the problem. So in this book, we work to expose and heal from these unclean spirits by articulating the where, the who, and the why of what King called this tangled web into which we are so deeply woven. And so we explore three trajectories. And the first is landlines. And here we're exploring where our ancestors came from and then where they settled and then where we settled. And the stories of violence and struggle for justice on those lands. And secondly, we explore bloodlines. And this is our embodied story, which we have inherited biologically and psychically from the, our familial, racial, ethnic, gender, cultural formation. So it includes travails and privileges, cultural loss and assimilation, and our settler moves to innocence and moral injury. And then the third is songlines. And by this, we mean our convictional traditions of faith that foster resilience and animate practices that help us to be human and to work for justice and healing of ourselves and society. So these are our ways of examining our histories, our communities, and landscapes which have shaped with and they've been they have been shaped and they've been misshaped by settler colonialism and so they've formed and deformed us and that's the work we're trying to uncover in this book that's powerful thank you i wonder how you know you talk about this kind of deep history of settler colonization white supremacy racism um, how did you come to write a book like this? How did you come to write a book on healing and uh, <laughs> settler colonization? Yeah, you know, and I wonder if my answer is going to resonate with other, other folks. I see a lot of folks um, that are a part of the Canadian Ruslander community whose grandparents, parents or great grandparents came um, from Russia in the 1920s. So as a child, I knew that something horrible had happened to all four of my Mennonite um, grandparents. And again, each of them came to Saskatchewan as refugees of the Russian revolution, but nobody was talking about it. I wanted to understand so at the age of 13, I interviewed my maternal grandmother on this little uh, cassette tape. And she spoke at length about the beauty and abundance her family had enjoyed during her uh, childhood years in Ostrovik, Ukraine. But as her narrative approached her teenage years, she began to weep and she could not continue. And because my gross mama was a joyful person and full of laughter, seeing her cry left an indelible impression on me. And this planted seeds of both curiosity and depredation. And only later would I learn how many women of my grandmother's generation suffered from PTSD and how the silence around their experiences negatively impacted our community. But the power of my grandmother's testimony and her tears inspired me to keep asking questions in the years to come. And then another episode that shaped me in my final year of college at what is now uh, CMU was when I volunteered with the Big Sisters Little Sisters program in Winnipeg. And I was paired with a 13 year old Cree girl uh, who had just been released from juvenile detention. She was living in a group home and she was pregnant for the second time. Her so-called crimes were behaviors that of course I now understand to be reactions to a racist colonial system that didn't meet her basic human needs. 
she, she described to me the pain of being forced to give up her first child and of not having any idea of where he was. And so on the cusp of adulthood myself, this encounter raised a new set of questions about her ancestors, how they had been displaced by mine on the Canadian prairies. And in retrospe retrospect, I believe this was my first tutorial in the hard truths of colonization. So this book is in part an attempt to understand how the lives of these three barely teenage girls, my grandmother, me and my little Cree sister are woven together. Of course, several other experiences intruded on my otherwise insular and privileged suburban existence, causing more disillusionments with my comfortable middle-class white world. But neither the church nor school offered avenues to process or understand the silences around family or Indigenous trauma. And so this is the work that actually drove me uh, into the restorative justice field and then in turn has led to this project. I, <clears throat> for my part, I don't come from a Mennonite background, um, but in 1980, as a young activist, I had the great fortune of attending an international conference mm -hmm. of indigenous sovereignty leaders from around the Pacific Basin. And that encounter changed the course of my activist work. And I spent the next decade living and working among indigenous communities that were dealing with the negative impacts of environmental degradation by industrial economies, superpower military bases, and continuing economic and political colonization throughout the Pacific Basin and Pacific Rim. Some of my colleagues and mentors from that time went on to help lay the groundwork for what became the Watershed United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples and they seeded the indigenous resurgence movement beginning with the worldwide protests around the Columbus Quincentenary in 1992. So um, as Elaine's work has turned over the last decade more and more toward indigenous justice, we saw a chance to collaborate on issues about which we both feel really passionate. So in this project, we feel called to invite and to support fellow descendants of European settlers into what we call a discipleship of decolonization. Certainly this is a moment in the United States where questions of longstanding racial injustice are in the air with an unprecedented intensity. Um, we're also aware that as white folk, we can easily become overwhelmed or paralyzed by this work. And we are frankly forever trying to deflect it. So. Uh, in this project, we take an approach that attempts to be both um, subjective and objective, that is looking at both personal and political dimensions of our colonial past and present. It's, uh, it's therefore a mix of memoir, of mostly having to do with Elaine's uh, family and community, of social analysis, uh, of theological reflection, and it also means to be a practical work workbook for those wanting to go deeper into this work. Um, I also want to say, Jamie, that we, we see this book as a kind of a companion to our Watershed Discipleship volume about bioregional faith and practice that was published five years ago, um, emphasizing that every one of our watersheds have been disfigured by this painful colonial history. Um, and therefore, ecological re-inhabitation must face these racist legacies, not just environmentally dysfunctional ones. Um, I, I saw that Luke Kreider in his overview in the Mennonite Quarterly Review this year of varieties of Anabaptist environmentalism and the challenge of environmental racism um, reviewed our Watershed Discipleship Project and he felt that it didn't sufficiently address a place's geography of privilege and its cycles of social power, as he put it. Um, in fact, we believe the first order of Watershed Discipleship is to understand the colonial history and legacy of one's bioregion. Uh, and moreover, that decolonization is best done at a watershed scale with indigenous communities. So we trust that Kreider's concerns um, will have been addressed in this uh, new book, which traces these landlines and bloodlines across three 
different watersheds in three different countries from Ukraine to Canada to uh, California. Thanks so much for sharing how this work comes out of your own lives. I think you know, where, where you just ended Shed talking about how our own inhabitation and formation within specific watersheds necessarily implicates us in this, this deeper history. I think you both have really testified to that uh, by narrating how this project comes out of your own lives. So thank you for doing that. I wanna to turn to talk a bit more about the contents of the book. And as I do so, I, I wanna let everybody listening know that at the bottom bar of the, the Zoom app, you can see a Q&A feature. And if you have a question for Chad uh, or Elaine, uh, please feel free to enter your question into that Q&A. We uh, have worked together to try to time the interview so that we'll have, we'll have enough time um, for a, at least a couple questions. Uh, we'd love to hear from you and hear your thoughts. Um, and hear Elaine and Shed's response uh, to what you have to say. So please make use of that Q&A box and we will uh, get to your questions in a little while. Uh, coming back to the book though, this title, you know, you've got, you've got, you've nailed the alliteration. <laughs> Healing Haunted right. History is a beautiful title, but also a haunting title in itself, you know, an evocative title. And I wonder if you could talk about what you mean by that. What is, what is that title trying to say? What kind of themes is it raising? And, you know, the book opens with this description of Stony Knoll, which you describe as a humble hill lying near the northern edge of the Great Plains. And you call this a contested, a sacred but contested site. Why would you start here, you know, as a way into this idea of healing haunted history? What how, what does a hill, this hill, have to do with haunting? Um, so this rather obscure concept of haunting, we think can be very illuminating to our task. Sociologist Avery Gordon describes haunting as a constituent element of modern social life through which suppressed or unresolved social violence makes itself known in everyday life. This is especially true when we settlers think this violence is done with or it's in the past or when its oppressive nature is continuously denied. So for example, when George Floyd dies because of a police knee on his neck, it immediately conjures up a flood of powerful hauntings in the consciousness of both white and black folk. Gordon points out that such moments of reckoning with collective hauntings can animate social movements of justice that can heal these violations. And we've seen this over the last few years in the Black Lives Matter movement or with the water protectors at Standing Rock. So these hauntings of past violations will never go away until justice is restored. We open our book by naming two places of haunting. One from where I grew up in Saskatchewan and it's pictured here and the other where we live now in the Ventura River watershed. So this is Stony Knoll, Obwashanao Chakatanao in Cree. It's about 45 miles north of my hometown in Saskatoon. This site typifies how indigenous land was taken by the colonial state and given to settlers. And here is the story. In 1876, Chief Young Chippewayan signed Treaty 6 in exchange for a 30 square mile tract of land of which Opwashamnau Chukatnau is at the symbolic center. But a decade later, the government without consultation or compensation to the band reassigned this land to Mennonite settlers. The young Chippewayans thus became a landless band. A hundred years later, in August of 1976, the government uh, sponsored gala was planned to celebrate Treaty 6. But indigenous groups in Saskatchewan were defiant, calling it a century of broken promises. 
And during the event, some young Chippewayans went to visit their historic land and they wanted to speak with farmers living in the area. Well, this stirred up fear, anxiety, prejudice among some of the Mennonites living in that area. It was a very difficult season, but eventually that has led to some restorative work. It was led by the young Chippewaians, the office of the treaty commissioner in Saskatchewan, supported by Mennonite and Lutheran farmers and churches in the area and Mennonite Central Committee, Saskatchewan. On, uh, <clears throat> on my part in the late 1960s, my family used to go camping on the Gaviota coast northwest of Santa Barbara one of the last undeveloped areas of chaparral habitat left in coastal Southern California and the heart of indigenous Chumash country. My time among those oak studded canyons and pristine beaches made a huge psychic imprint on my adolescent consciousness, connecting me to a sense of place as a fifth generation Californian. My dad loved to explore remote areas of the state, perhaps because his mother was a Californio, a Mexican Californian. So we often camped in a place called Tahiguas Canyon, former site, I learned much later, of a Chumash village called Tahiwa. One year, my dad called attention to an old coast live oak. Um, <clears throat> and uh, <clears throat> uh, it was a rendering, as you can see here, of um, a Chumash neophyte receiving communion from a Spanish Padre. Uh, this site is near one of the 21 Franciscan missions that form the backbone of Spanish colonization of Alta California, uh, stretching from San Diego to Sonoma. At the time, um, similar to Elaine's story, there was no conversation about the history behind this image. We just called it the Indian tree. It was kind of a curiosity. But it was my first exposure as an already alienated teenager growing up in an unchurched home um, to the heavy footprint of the missionary colonizing history in my home bioregion. And this fading photograph, which is hung on my wall for the 40 years since, it's always haunted me. So now we live in Chumash country and work with local elders and act activists trying to understand and heal that past. So that's, those are a couple of reasons why the, the notion of haunting we find to be a very uh, animating one. Yeah, well, that's powerfully rooted in your stories, I can hear. Um, and I think probably most, not all of us in this call <laughs> can uh, think to our own hauntings and think about our own ways that um, our formation uh, is haunted by these settler uh, colonial histories. I wonder, you know, in the in the uh, subtitle of the of the book, it's uh, a settler uh, discipleship of decolonization. So this suggests kind of a a broader um, practice. I wonder, beyond kind of going deep into our own family histories, what what are you hoping for people to be able to do to to address these haunted histories? Well, as you know, um, the term decolonization has become very popular over the last decade, both in academia and also in social justice circles. And frankly, to some extent, it's gotten rather diluted. Uh, so Unangash scholar Eve Tuck argues that decolonization should connote the concrete struggle for the repatriation of indigenous land and life. It should not function simply as a vague metaphor for all manner of social justice work. Uh, we agree, and we think that doing this landlines, bloodlines, and songlines work helps each of us to discover how we settlers are all implicated in this history and diseased by the colonial spirits of occupation and possession. In order to be about healing, then, our, our discipleship must lead to contextual repractices of reschooling ourselves in this history and legacy of practicing restorative solidarity and above all, experimenting with reparative justice. And so we understand a settler discipleship of decolonization to mean 
um, what Audre Lorde calls doing our own work. And this is about learning the history of the lands where our immigrant ancestors settled and where we live now and the struggles for justice in those places. It's about reckoning with harms and building capacity for response ability. It's about combating ways we settlers practice a willful unknowing and our moves to innocence. And it's about making covenants and taking concrete steps of solidarity in relationship with communities injured by past and present injustices. At the conclusion of the book, we highlight practices of reparative initiative taken by individuals, denominations, and governmental bodies that have experiment or that are experimenting with decolonization. And some of these are very almost simple processes uh, to get us involved in this work. And then some are very um, costly um, practices. And so we invite readers to join us on that journey to imagine what, what our uh, practices as individuals, churches, denominations, communities could be. That's really helpful. So it sounds like it's not just about getting to know your own story and thinking, you know, uh, thinking about how your own, you know, your own lives are implicated, but it's also about uh, how that work is part of, but only part of the work of seeking repair and justice. Um, that is challenging work. I mean, just, just to think carefully about our own lives is hard work uh, enough. And I know you talk a lot about trauma in the book and trauma healing and so forth, but I'm wondering, you know, when you think about, and you, when you've talked about and written about uh, these kind of systemic issues. Have you received pushback? Has there been challenges to, to your approach that you've, you've heard? You think? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, of course. Um, and, and those challenges are not just around us, they're within yeah, us. Yeah, um, sure. And so that's why we devote a whole section in the book to really trying to examine um, our settler strategies of denial and resistance. Uh, so one prominent example is the way in which we all tend to feel personally detached from history. That's a uniquely North American settler conceit. It's a kind of a ahistoric individualism that uh, we understand our, ourselves as free floating entities that are neither constrained, much less advantaged by the past. So I am neither connected nor accountable to a history, which is not my fault. I didn't displace indigenous peoples. I don't own slaves. Um, and moreover, I am disinterested in how I might continue to benefit from in the present from these historic arrangements. And then if demands for justice do impinge upon my consciousness, I see no reason to revisit the past. So that, you know, that's kind of a, a typical, a little bit stereotypical description of, of one of our strategies of denial. We often find ourselves using a, the common dodge, quote, just let sleeping dogs lie. And we, we researched this, and interestingly, this council dates back 300 years to Britain's first prime minister, Robert Walpole, in the mid-18th century. Walpole was trying to deflect attention from how England's policies of extracting wealth from the American colonies were uh, impacting the New World, and among the sleeping dogs that he wished to leave unexamined was how his own fortune had been made in the New World's speculative market for slaves and exotic imports. Mm -hmm. So it's a little bit like how right now some Trump aligned Republican lawmakers are responding to last week's armed assault on the US Capitol by exhorting us to just move past it and try to heal the divisions, divisions that they themselves have been militantly sowing rather than squarely facing that historic violation and the forces behind it and demanding accountability. Canadian sociologist Frances Swerpa, in her book, Storied Landscapes, identifies another typical strategy, uh, the settler luxury of forgetting. But she warns that the absolution of amnesia just makes us afraid of our own past and of, contention, uh, and of the contention it invites. A helpful diagnostic term that we found is colonial agnosia. And this means we don't know about 
the past and present violations of colonization. We don't know what we don't know, and we simply don't really care. This is the foundation of what Eve Tuck calls settlers moves to innocence. And these are our attempts to convince ourselves that we aren't responsible for or to the history and the ongoing disaster of colonization. This imagined innocence in turn undermines our personal and political ability to respond, hence our use of the term response ability. Dina Gilio Whitaker, borrowing from Robin DiAngelo's popular work, calls these strategies of self-exoneration settler fragility. And this is the need to distance oneself from complicity and the inability to talk about unearned privilege. And I want to say, because we are talking to a Mennonite audience, and it is a Mennonite story that is running through this book. This book is just me doing my own work about what I have, I have inherited in my Mennonite community and family and story. And so the book invites everybody um, to do that own work. So some of the resistance we've heard is that, man, you're hard on Mennonites. Well, everybody doing their own work is going to, every, all settlers doing their own work are going to be hard and hope, I mean, hopefully compassionate and balanced on trying to wrestle through our family and communal narrative and the ways that we step into agnosia, moves to innocence, all of settler fragility. So uh, I think you probably hooked a lot of us here. You certainly have hooked me uh, in this, this short interview so far. Um, and you cast a vision of doing, you know, as, as you quoted Audre Lord, doing this work on ourselves um, with these different issues in mind. When we sit down and read this book and close the last page, <laughs> what are you hoping to happen? What do you, what do you hope for us to get out of it? And, and, and what kind of difference do you hope the book will make? Thank you. Our friend, Dee Dee Risher, in her beautiful book uh, called The Soul Making Room, wonders. If we are honest about our pain, will we cause another to falter? And will our vulnerability bring us healing? Or will it simply become eviscerated by spectator pity? But she exhorts us, tell the truth about everything, especially the things that go wrong. So this has kind of guided our work. And the great Swiss psychotherapist, Carl Jung wisely warned, the right way to wholeness is made up unfortunately of fateful detours and wrong turnings. It is the longissima via. It is not straight, but it is snake-like. A path whose labyrinthine twists and turns are not lacking in terrors. So this work requires both inward and outward journeys as we try to deconstruct our settler presumptions of innocence, entitlement, and hegemony while trying to deepen our relationships with Indigenous communities. Our settler way to wholeness is indeed a labyrinthine one of disillusionment weaning ourselves off of devised and dismembered identities and histories, and that's what we focus on in part one, and de-assimilation and restorative, uh, restorative solidarity, which we focus on in part two. A discipleship of decolonization equips and inspires white settler Christians and others to do our own work, facing past and present, looking within and around us, struggling for justice here and now, and to engage our circles of landlines, bloodlines, and song lines is to embrace the promise of the old Shaker song. Tis the gift to come down where we ought to be, to bow and to bend, we shan't be ashamed, but to turn and turn will be our delight, till by turning, turning, we come round right. 
We saw a beautiful glimpse of this hope at our Bartimaeus Kinsler Institute last year, which we hold annually here in Southern California, in which participants delved deeply into this kind of work. At the conclu conclusion of a very intense week, one of our indigenous interlocutors, our friend Harry Lafond, a Muskeg Lake Cree elder from Saskatchewan, led more than a hundred of us in a round dance. A beautiful tradition that is linked to the Northern Lights, which Cree believe are spirits of ancestors dancing to help us heal. And it did help us. And then local, uh, local Chumash scholar, Matthew Vestudo, offered a Ventureño phrase, huki shunush kui, to describe the goal of our work. It connotes a different kind of settling, he explains, an agreement to do something good together in the future, a promise or a covenant. So it is our very much our prayer that this book will help equip and empower us as settlers to dance together with our indigenous neighbors into a decolonized future so that indeed by turning, turning, we come round right. And we appreciate this opportunity to talk with you all about it. <clears throat> well, may that vision be so. Thank you so much for sharing uh, about your book and your own journey in writing this book. Uh, can't wait to see it soon. Um, and as one commenter says, the vision of Mennonites dancing is itself <laughs> powerful. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, that? <laughs> we have a couple questions and a few minutes to address them. So uh, the first question comes from Devin Miller, who's a recent Anabaptist witness author. So you can uh, read an essay by him and um, alongside uh, Elaine and Ched's uh, book preview in uh, the new issue of Anabaptist Witness. Um, but Devin asks, do you see decolonization as a goal or as a process? What would complete decolonization look like? Well, yeah, I mean, I, I think the answer to that is yes, it's, <laughs> it's a goal and a process. Um, and I think the, the way is made in the walking of it. Um, the, the you know, 500 years of colonization has so remade the landscape and our communities and our psyches that it's actually difficult to imagine what it would be like to, to live truly free of it. Uh, and that makes it both difficult to sometimes articulate, um, but also um, energizes the, the process because of its urgency to really remake ourselves. But you know, we, we are people of faith who embrace a tradition that uh, the Apostle Paul in 2 Corinthians uh, likened conversion to being a whole new human being, a whole new people in Christ, um, based on reconciliation, which he saw not as a, a cheap kind of grace, like settlers asking for immediate forgiveness for past wrongs, but rather this notion of balancing the books and restoring equity. Um, so I think that, that that's why we use the term discipleship. It is an unfolding and walking this way, oftentimes without um, knowing uh, the next what's what's around the next turn. Um, so yeah, I, th I think it's very much of a, a journey and a and a pilgrimage. Mm -hmm. And I and I would just add, and this is where I, I'd probably bring it back to the 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 idea of, of a watershed discipleship because you know, what does decolonization look like? And, and at its center is authentic relationship with indigenous folks and determining how to take these steps together. Uh, we, I don't think as settlers can determine um, when we have reached uh, a level of decolonization, but in relationship um, with indigenous folks and um, coming alongside, being directed by their desires for uh, where we should focus energies of justice and struggle um, helps shape what our discipleship of decolonization looks like. The only way to really answer the question is to do it. <laughs> yes, yeah, it's to, exactly. It's to engage in the relationships because we are not the people who are going to be able to say <laughs> whether we're really doing right. it. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, we have a question from Sheldon Burkhalter that uh, asks, it refers to uh, the book preview. And so if folks listening have not seen the preview of Healing Haunted Histories that we published on our website, I invite you to go uh, to the website and, and find that um, a really wonderful essay is one of the kind of theological interlude reflections in the book. Um, Sheldon asks in reference to the essay, one might think about uh, the words and story of Joshua and the conquest of Palestine. Interpretation and language are very important. I think the point, if I can interpret this question somewhat, is asking about what kind of frameworks are most adequate to understanding what's going on. And the example that Sheldon gives is when we talk about the doctrine of discovery, should we be talking about the church that includes, you know, Mennonites and Presbyterians and so forth, or should we be talking about the Pope who, you know, whose bull, papal bulls and so forth got that process underway? Um, what is the primary, what, what is the best kind of frame of reference that we should be using uh, when we speak and act as Christians? Hmm. Yeah, well, that I, I guess uh, that's a little bit like asking, you know, when we try to understand the Constitution, should we be talking about John Locke or uh, John Adams? I mean, it's there's a history of the development of ideas, and yeah, it um, the doctrine of, it's, of discovery um, got its start with papal bulls in the 15th century, but um, it's a long history of both theological doctrine and legal doctrine um, has pervaded both ecclesial culture and political culture. So um, I, th I think um, our denominations, not least um, MCUS and MC Canada have done a good job at trying to both trace this history and um, Conf, you know, confront this history. I don't like the word repudiate because that's sometimes a little too easy. All we have to do is denounce something. Actually, what we have to do is we have to understand the full extent of that disease in us, um, in, including low church dissident denominations like Mennonites. Um, but I, I do think it's good that we're doing that work within our own denominations. Uh, Mennonites have their own this Doctrine of Discovery Coalition. I think that's great. Um, there are also obviously Catholic, Roman Catholics who are working on this um, uh, very expressly uh, in the Vatican. Um, <clears throat> so we're doing our own work, we're doing our own denominational work, um, but this is a collective history and uh, whether or not we're Catholic, we, we've all been shaped by doctrines of, of discovery. So uh, that's, that's an example of the layers um, of trying to untangle this uh, this web that's woven around us, uh, obviously a key one. And I just want to add that most of the major denominations in North America or Turtle Island are working on repudiating the doctrine of discovery, but also working on issues of of decolonization. So are not uh, well I, are doing that are doing that work, which is a hopeful sign. Thank you. Uh, we'll have time for one more question. And if we don't get to all of the questions here, feel free to follow up uh, with any of us. You can find our contact online. And uh, I will, in a moment, give the last word to Elaine and Chad to talk a bit about, more about how you can find their book and uh, how you can connect with them. Um, so, uh, but our, our last question is a very practical question. And it kind of goes back to, you know, Chad, I think it was you who quoted Eve Tuck in her definition of decolonization being very practically oriented towards uh, indigenous land restoration. And Frank Ramirez asked, has anyone actually given land back? Yes, um, there are a, you know, we highlight one example of a Quaker woman who, where she's in the Midwest somewhere, but gave her land back to the Oneida tribe yeah. in New York, yeah. thank you. Um, there are other individuals, some of which are Mennonites who have given shares of the sale of their land. So there, there are experiments of giving land back on an individual level. There's certainly um, examples of um, denominations giving land back. Um, 
Catholics at Rosebud, Presby uh, Rosebud Reservation, um, uh, Presbyterians at Stony Point, just outside of New York, Methodists to the Wyandotte tribe, and then larger political government bodies. So yes, it is out there. Um, just simply Googling uh, online uh, re repatriation to Indigenous uh, tribes, bands, and then in our book, we, we again go through highlighting a number of these efforts. In, in our work, we like to say that <clears throat> no step is too small and no step is too great. Uh, and so we, we try to trace personal initiatives, community initiatives, church, uh, congregational and denominational initiatives, Political initiatives such as the um, uh, small town in Northern California um, gave uh, back an island um, to the indigenous tribe that had been massacred there 150 years ago. Um, so this is, and, and these are all small experiments. In many ways, they're they're symbolic, but they're also substantive. That um, it takes these small initiatives to open up space for the next step and the next step. And so obviously, it's our hope that. Um, we followers of Jesus can be on the vanguard of these experiments, trying to show the way um, for the tradition of what we call in our tradition repentance, which is the process of turning ourselves around both personally and politically uh, and embracing a vision of the kingdom. So again, we're, we're so grateful to have this opportunity to talk with our fellow Mennonites um, about this project and really hope that it can be a useful tool to you all in your own work. Well, thank you so much to both of you for what you've done, your life uh, of witness to these, uh, to the call to repentance and the possibility of healing and real turning. Uh, and thank you for this contribution of uh, this book. Um, I'll let you say in a moment about where people can find it and connect with you more. But before we do so, I want to thank everyone um, for joining us here for this first of our Anabaptist Witness Dialogues series. We'll be back on February 11th uh, with Randy uh, De uh, Haluza DeLay, a Canadian sociologist who has an article in our new issue of Anabaptist Witness, um, and uh, Randy Woodley. Um, an indigenous theologian um, talking about this question around displacement of indigenous peoples and land. So I hope you'll join us for that. Um, as I mentioned at the beginning, Anabaptist Witness Dialogues is a uh, webinar, new webinar series from Anabaptist Witness Journal, which I edit. Uh, the journal is a publication of Anabaptist Mennonite Biblical Seminary, uh, Mennonite Central Committee, Mennonite Church Canada, and Mennonite Mission Network. And uh, many thanks to uh, those agencies for their support um, for the journal and for this webinar. Uh, you can learn more about the journal, about Anabaptist Witness um, on our uh, website, anabaptistwitness.org, as well as on our Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram feeds. And the person who uh, is responsible for uh, maintaining those feeds is the person who has been uh, behind the scenes uh, bringing this webinar about. That is Marcos Acosta, uh, a student at AMBS uh, and my assistant on this project. And so a, a huge thanks to him. Um, he will be actually uh, hosting in March when he interviews his father, Luis Acosta, uh, and Linda Shelley from Mennonite Mission Network. And uh, in reference to the last question, they will be talking about uh, work that the, uh, a team of Mennonites um, working with the Mennonite Mission Network in the Argentine Chaco accompanied a group of Mokovi indigenous uh, community uh, in buying back their land um, in the Argentine Chaco. So a very relevant piece that you can read if you read Spanish um, also on our website. Um, I invite you to do that. Um, thanks to you all, and especially thanks to Elaine and Shed for your presence here. Where can we get your book? <laughs> well, thank you, and thanks to all of you who have hung on here till the end. We've got a, an offer for you. Um, Healing Haunted Histories will be available 
in mid February. And if you visit, and Chad just posted this, so if you visit chadmyers.org backslash HHH and sign up for our email list, we will send you a 40% off coupon. Um, these books ain't cheap. These books are not cheap. It's a long book. It's 400 pages. Uh, we tried to make it simpler. Yeah, I know. We tried. It didn't turn out that way. It is 400 pages long. So you have to pre-order. Um, we are only able to uh, share this discount through the end of, end of January. So obviously 40% off is a significant um, discount. So if you're interested, please uh, go to the website listed there. There's another opportunity um, that we'd love to share with you all. Our, our nonprofit, Bartimaeus Cooperative Ministry, hosts an annual institute in mid-February. It's previous years, we've always gathered together here on Shumash territory in Southern California. But this year, of course, we're going to be online. Um, we look at aspects of biblical faith and social justice. Our last two gatherings have dealt with indigenous justice and settler solidarity solidarity with participants from all over North America, Australia, um, other places. So next month, our program is going to be online. And our theme is deepening practices of restorative solidarity. Um, we're going to explore for the third time in a year, decolonizing discipleship and hear from seasoned faith leaders like uh, Choctaw Bishop Steve Charleston, Cherokee activist lawyer Allison McCrary, Ferguson activist and pastor Starsky Wilson and MC USA's own Sue Parker. So for more information, uh, go to our website under the study program and look for the Bartimaeus Institute. So friends, we hope you can uh, join us again. Here is, uh, Chad just posted the information about the discount offer and then also about the Bartimaeus Kinsler Institute. Thank you all. And thank you, Jamie. Yeah, thank you, Jamie. Yeah, it's been wonderful to be with you. Thanks for this opportunity to speak about this book. We're excited it's finally out there and it's wonderful to share it with you all. And congratulations on launching the podcast. Yes. <laughs> thank you so much. Thanks for being the first and uh, can't wait to see the book in print. <laughs> right. Thank you. Thanks. Us too. <laughs> Thanks, everybody. Thank you all. Bye, everyone.